name is uh, Shafiq Hamani, and I'm a member on the ACR board, Chicago chapter. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, our topic tonight is bandaging the wounds. And here is a brief uh, summary, uh, which will be this will be presented by two presenters, uh, Honorable Kamran Jivani from Atlanta, and Ms. Zora Tejani from Washington DC. Uh, mediation can set parties suffering from the trauma of a dispute onto a path of healing. This is a central principle underpinning the work of the Aga Khan Conciliation and Arbitration Board, CAB for short. This discussion will outline six of the restorative practices employed by CAB USA when seeking to initiate a healing process, i.e. bandaging wounds of parties, namely one, consciously empathetic process, two, referrals for interinstitutional support services, three, self-help self resources, four, tools for considering the needs of non-party children, five, a forward-looking end of mediation session, and six, Honorable Kamran Jivan appears in his personal capacity as a mediator and national board member of the ICANN Conciliation and Arbitration Board. Professionally, he serves as a lead judge of the Patent Trial and Appeal Board at the U.S. Patent and Trademark. In the U.S., CAB mediates approximately 150 cases per year pro bono using 50 volunteer mediators across the country. Um, I would like to now go to Ms. Zora Tijani. Would you like to introduce yourself and then you guys can take over. Sure, thank you so much. So, um, hello everyone, my name is Zora Talib Tijani. I am a practicing attorney in the DC metro area, as you heard. Uh, my professional, in my professional life, I am an assistant general counsel for VMware. So for the past two years, I've, I lead a team of eight legal professionals who support the company's government, education, and healthcare businesses. So for those of you who don't know, just to orient you, VMware is a software cloud and cybersecurity company based out of Silicon Valley. And before VMware, I was in-house with Microsoft for 14 years. And I'll spare you the bio before that. Uh, in my for, for CAB USA, I am a member of the Northeast Regional CAB, and I am one of those volunteer mediators. Thank you. Great. Well, and as Shafiq kindly said, I'm Kamran Javani, and Zora and I serve together on CAB. As a logistical matter for folks, I'm getting a bit of feedback, so if you wouldn't mind, we're happy to take questions in real time as they come, but if you would please mute until you have a question or a comment, that'd be great just so that we can cut out some of that feedback. Um, ah, that worked. There we go. Very good. Very good. Okay. So thank you very much, ACR Chicago, for having us and Shafiq for the warm introduction. I was commenting a moment ago that um, ACR Chicago in particular has been a really great longtime friend and supporter of CAD and sponsor of our most recent event. And we're really grateful for the continued friendship and partnership and collaboration. We thought today would be useful um, to kind of walk through our practices that CAB has developed around what we call bandaging wounds. It's the notion that mediation can be used to put folks on a path of healing. It's not the idea that mediation is a form of counseling because we're pretty, we're pretty careful to avoid that. It's, it, we, we know it's not counseling, but it is a way to address pain at some level. Um, and it is a way to, to deal with issues so that one can at least start to look to tomorrow with a sense of optimism hope, and believe in the notion that tomorrow will be better than today, even if mediation doesn't result in full resolution, right? So even if you're gonna live with the conflict and not have a resolution, we still believe at our core that the process can help people feel better about living and find a happier, better way to move forward. So with that, I'll give you a little bit of background, Zora and I both will, on CAB and kind of 
how it is that you came to be thinking about this process and thinking about mediation as a tool for healing. I know a lot of you are familiar with CAD, so we'll keep that really brief, and then we'll just get straight into the, the meat of, of what it is we do to set people on a path of healing. So by way of background, quickly, um, CAD was founded in 1986. It's really what it is, is it's a global dispute resolution system. So in about 24 countries at the moment, but certainly over 20, um, folks can seek the assistance of CAD. And what that means is asking for pro bono mediation. Um, and CAB will oblige, and it will oblige in local disputes where two folks are resident, and it'll oblige in disputes across the world. And we have about 30 to 40 percent of our caseload that is interregional and international cases, so where the parties are remote one from the other. And nevertheless, we will mediate. <laughs> that, that is all possible because we rely pretty strongly on the co-mediation model whenever whenever we can. So we try to have at least one mediator in the physical presence of at least one party. Uh, and the reason we can co-mediate is because we have sister boards across the world. So CAD USA has 18 partner boards. So it's a total of 18 CADs in the network across the world um, that mediate in the language of that country and we all go through a global standardized training program together. So it's a 40 hour residential program um, where we all have the same skill set, at least at a base level, and that allows us to rely on our co mediator and know that they're approaching mediation in the same manner that we are locally. We serve a community called the Ismaili Muslim community. There are many different interpretations of Islam, Ismailism is one of them. Um, if you're familiar with the Shia Sunni framework, Ismailism is a Shia interpretation of Islam. It is the second largest Shia community in the world. There's no single ethnicity or language or cultural identity that unites Ismailis. Um, really what it is, is our recognition of the Aga Khan as our spiritual leader um, and his role is to interpret our faith for modern times. Um, and in that interpretation, we're called on to serve our community and broader society. And there are lots of different ways to do that. Um, the way that I happen to do it and Zora happens to do it is we serve in the Aga Khan Conciliation and Arbitration Board. So we're volunteers. The whole board is comprised of volunteers. There's 40, there's 54 of us across the U.S. right now. Everybody commits to about a three-year term of service. It's renewable once, so it can be up to about six years. Yeah. Um, you're done. And you go on to mediate and serve in other organizations like our colleague Shafi Kamani, who was a CAB mediator for some time and is now a CAB alumnus and ACR board member there in Chicago. CAB is intentionally non-lawyer heavy. We really practice community mediation. We are not court annex mediation. There are times when parties come to us and litigation's already going, and so we do require that they seek a stay of that litigation. But really, we're community mediation. We're grounded in the principle that folks can come together in a peaceful manner and perhaps with facilitated dialogue or assistance or on mediation and conciliation, can come to their own reasonable solutions to their problems. Um, it's not easy and it takes time. Our average duration is about six months in large part because we reality test by you know, coming to a resolution and then the parties go live with it for a while and they come back and see, did it work, did it not work? And they kind of take one issue at a time um, and we go session after session until hopefully we arrive at resolution. Um, that's a two-second nutshell of CAB and kind of what we do. The reason I think that we really come around in our focus areas to think about healing and about bandaging wounds is a couple fold. One, you know, we serve this closely knit community of 20 million folks across the globe, um, and that means that we're constantly looking at kind of resolution, both on an individual dispute 
context, but also on a more global scale, looking at within the community, you know, what are the sources of dispute and what remediation can be done, and particularly what dispute prevention can be done, but also kind of what's overall harmony within that community? What does that look like? Um, and we're cognizant of the fact that our parties go back to living life in the same communities where they came from, whether that's the school community, our faith community, whatever it may be, ultimately, it's pretty likely that life's going to continue and you're going to see this person tomorrow and the next day and continuing thereafter. Um, and so we look for ways in which folks can exit dispute with honor, with integrity. So that's how we came here. There are six key practices um, for healing. And I know I've been talking for a while now, so I'll run down the six real quick, and then I promise you that we will talk for a little while. Um, so the six are, one, empathy. That's probably our biggest. Um, two is referrals, and when to, to say, we need help in helping you and going out and getting those folks. Um, three is self-help resources. Another one is just really getting people to think about <laughs> the child, when there's a dispute that focuses on a child or involves a child, um, so that's four. Five is um, a really specifically narrowly focused end of mediation session. So beyond kind of the notion that mediation's over, we're signing agreement or we're not signing agreement and that's that, um, but really looking at the path forward and how do we move forward. Um, and six is we do follow up. We call the parties three months later, up to six months later, and check in. The actual mediators go back and check in and see, how are you doing now? Is life actually better? So we'll come to all that. Zora, I'm going to be quiet now. Okay, thank you, Kamran. So can everyone hear me? Great. Um, so as Kamran mentioned, the first practice is an empathetic mediation process. So this is a primary technique for really engendering healing in the parties. Um, and it is the creation of that empathetic mediation. So you can think about it as infusing empathy throughout the mediation. And so CAB USA mediators are periodically trained over a three-year cycle um, to employ these empathetic um, responses with the parties during that mediation. Um, the training itself involves exercises where the mediators practice engaging with the parties um, with empathy. Um, that can be through nonverbal cues, reflective listening techniques, um, and, and you know, honoring the desire of the parties to be heard in a respectful, confidential, and non-judgmental way. And you know, it's important to note that these training sessions really focus on balancing the empathetic responses while also maintaining the neutrality of the mediator. And so, you know, that is, you know, you're, empath you're empathizing with the pain that the party feels due to the way they're perceiving a particular situation without necessarily agreeing with the way the party is per you know, perceiving or how they're assessing the situation. So that nuance is an important element of the training as well. To, to give you know, a little color and example to understand the impact of this uh, kind of key practice of an empathetic mediation process, you know, I, I'll share that you know, I was mediating a particularly combative matrimonial dispute. Um, and, and one party who was on one hand combative was really on, at a deeper level, feeling enormous guilt. And, you know, so, the, the, so much so that this party was actually seeking professional counseling. So that wasn't my role as the co-mediator. Um, I, you know, but it was the fact that as mediators, we were neutral, we were not judgmental, and we could lend a, a gentle, kind ear to hear this person's side of the dispute and for them to just explain their view as to why they were feeling this guilt and kind of from their perspective, just having that non-judgmental, gentle, kind, uh, you, know, um, per, you know, sense through the mediation process, I think really helped this particular party with the guilt that um, she was feeling. And so with that, Kamran, I'll turn it over to you.
Okay. Can I ask a question about MPV? I, yeah. I myself have sort of wondered, you know, I find I tend to be pretty empathetic in an individual session, right? In a joint session, I'm a little hesitant just because I feel like it can be, you know, misperceived as bias. Um, what are your thoughts there? Do you find yourself doing the same thing? You know, I mean, I, I think I have also found the Kamran in a joint session, you might have less of the kind of sharing that you might in an individual session. So even the need to have to really yeah. have that step back moment to really have the body language or the empathetic response that's needed in that moment kind of comes up less in the joint session I have also found. Um, I guess if it yeah. would come up, um, you know, and I, I haven't really experienced it to that extent, but I think you're right. I would probably show empathy with perhaps a, a tad more restraint, but like I said, I think it comes up less. Yeah, that may, that's an excellent point. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll speak to referrals. So one of, I think, the key things that we've been able to develop over time is relationships with other service providers. So we train our mediators um, across the country to recognize instances where we think there are other forms of assistance that a party needs, whether that's counseling and professional counseling, or if it's in the context of a matrimonial dispute and the parties are separating and, and one of the parties is saying, you know what, I really am gonna need vocational skills after this because I've not had to earn a living for 20 years. I've been responsible for maintaining my household and, and now life is economically different. Um, so we have a network of, of different providers that we turn to, some from within our community, Aga Khan entities like the Social Welfare Board, the Aga Khan Economic Planning Board, those folks who can address kind of the issues that I've just described, um, but also resources that are outside our community, um, particularly counselors that are outside our community. You know, folks sometimes want somebody within, sometimes without, whatever. Um, one, of a, one of our great referral sources has actually been school counselors, because we often find, particularly in matrimonial context, no matter what's happening, you're staying together or you're not, there's, there's just issues for that kid to deal with. And, you know, children are never in our mediations, and even if they were, we're not counselors, but we pretty easily can tell parties that they should seek out that resource, and they're pretty good about doing it. Um, so, you know, we have kind of a warm handover process for some instances where we feel like there's an exigent need, um, particularly if in the context of mediation, a flag raises in our mind around competence. So then we very quickly reach out to mental health professionals that work with us to figure out, is this party competent to sit mediation? Um, so there is a, a warm process where we can reach out to those folks very quickly with party consent um, and to figure that out. But in most instances, all it really takes is us saying, you might want to think about X, and giving over a couple names and phone numbers and kind of making sure that they start the process of reaching out to those folks. We've kind of primed them up for the general notion that folks will call and say, hey, CAB referred me, um, but we never reach out to our partners and just in general say, X person will be calling, right? Um, you know, for confidentiality purposes, as you can imagine. But questions there on referrals? I imagine that other folks have a similar process, maybe, maybe not, um, community mediators on the line. We'd be really interested to hear kind of how you partner with other service providers outside the mediation context. Or maybe in the room. All right, well, while you mull that over for a moment, uh, we'll switch on to self-help resources. Okay, sure. And before we go there, maybe I can give another example, Kamran, where um, a party was really worried and feeling concerned. So, you know, we talk about the emotional healing, um, really concerned about losing healthcare insurance because once the divorce, you know, was going to be final, um, they were on the other spouse's employer's plan. And this individual was very concerned 
and afraid of what they were going to do without healthcare insurance. But through this referral process, we were able to refer the party over to um, the health board to talk to someone about securing health insurance. And so while that was an immediate need, it gave that emotional comfort where one more less thing to worry about in a very stressful situation. So I thought I'd share that as, as an example. No, that's great. And you know, often I find those sorts of very real world life logistical things mm -hmm. can become hindrances to a resolution, right? Like yeah. how many times have you encountered somebody who says, I'm just trapped. Like, I know what the solution is. I just can't make it work. Right, right. It's a great point. Okay, well then to the self-help. So this is another practice. And um, so CAP USA maintains an extensive library of articles, videos, and presentations targeted towards individual skill building in key areas such as emotional health, health care, anger management, and effective communication strategies. And so these are resources that are shared with the parties throughout the course of the mediation, you know, particularly at times when the parties are receptive to actually receiving them. So I'll give you an example of where there's one that might be uh, uh, helpful even when they're particularly not realizing they need to hear it. Um, but, you know, and, and the other thing I'll share is that a lot of these resources are available in multiple languages. So really to help meet the needs of, of the diverse community that we serve, um, that CAB USA serves. One example, as I was kind of alluding to, and, you know, one of my favorite kind of go-to articles that we have is prepared by the Mayo Clinic staff. A very, you know, well-regarded source. And the article is called Forgiveness, letting go of grudges and bitterness. Um, and what I have found is so impactful. I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's a medical article. You know, it, it explains the connection between forgiveness and a number of medical benefits, just as an example, lowering your blood pressure. And the other part of the article that's just, I think, really impactful, and I, I, that's why I keep using it, is that you know, when you think about what is forgiveness, that explains what is forgiveness in addition to talking about the health benefits, it really distinguishes between that letting go of the resentment and thoughts of revenge, for example, that can come with um, a dispute and, and separating that out from the pers other person's responsibility from hurting you. So explaining that forgiveness doesn't mean or didn't mean you're denying that this person hurts you, but it is you letting go of the resentment of boss and here are the health benefits. So the article is easy to read. And like I said, it's one of my go-to articles and I found it to be really highly impactful and I'm happy to share it with those who, who don't already have it. Sorry, do you find that folks are, <clears throat> excuse me, receptive to it? You know, they are. <laughs> and I was kind of saying like, this is one where they may not even really need to know. They, they may not even have the self-awareness, I mean, to say, yeah, you know, I really need to work on this forgiveness thing. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not even there yet. But I have found that there are key times when you're kind of getting towards um, the actual drafting of the settlement agreement. So you're kind of almost done and you're, you know, you're kind of wrapping things up. So I, I may not even wait until that, the, the final step in the closeout, which I'm, I'll talk about later. But um, there are times during, or if the parties are feeling stuck because they're just so mired in anger at what happened, that I'm, I'll i just offer this up, even if they're not particularly receptive, to say, hey, there's this really good article. That's a, it's a medical article by the Mayo Clinic, and I think you'll really find it interesting. It's about the health benefits of forgiveness. And I have found folks um, receptive to receiving it. Nice. So I think what's really interesting about what you've just described is the stage of the process at which you offer. Mm -hmm. I, and it's been my experience that when folks first show up, there's mm -hmm. just so much and they just want to be heard, right? And so those initial sessions, that initial joint session even, um, it, it's, they're probably not open and receptive yet. But as you say, kind of toward the end, as we're getting closer to either resolution or, or parting ways, um, it does make sense. You yeah. know, I'll tell you candidly, when I first went through our training and learned about this, I was very skeptical. It, it just it seemed a little too magical, right? And a little too fanciful to say, here's a book on tape. Enjoy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, 
But what I've found is that they are sort of bite-sized, right? As you say, the Mayo article, I mean, even sort of saying the Mayo Clinics article, it's not like a journal article that's 30 pages long and academic, right? It's a very practical, useful tool. And I'll say one of our colleagues, Zora, recently said to me that she through the resources, picks phrases, and, um, and just will send them over to the parties by, like, taking her phone and just catching an image of it. And so a sentence or two that are important, she'll send over just as a nugget to get them started thinking about it. No, oh, that's great. That's a great technique. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. All right, so needs of the children. I kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but you know, as, we, as I said, particularly in matrimonial cases, folks just come in with so much emotion and they're so positional when they first come to us that often you know, it's just difficult to see the impact of dispute on the child involved in that family. Um, and so we've developed a set of tools to get for mediators to gently kind of bring the parties to a position of thinking about the best interest of the child and, and more the impact of the dispute on the child long term. So, you know, whether that's something formal like a bill of rights in a co-parenting plan that says you have the right to not hear, a child has the right to not hear their parent be disparaged by their other parent, right? A really powerful thing. Um, or something very informal, like at the beginning of a dispute, just sort of asking about what's life like for your kid? How is that, how's that working in this family dynamic? What's it, what's happening to them and personality-wise and school-wise when, when disputes flare? Um, you know, it's just a way to start thinking about the, putting that kid first, thinking about best interest of the child, but not relative as to best interest of me. So I might desire, for instance, full custody, um, but really thinking through, is that in the best interest? It may well be, it may not be. Um, but so there's a set of articles and videos and a technique that we talk through, but it's really grounded in empathy and in directed questioning, right? So ended questions that are a little bit Socratic, and as I said earlier, we really, really push referrals to school guidance counselors because we never want to wade into that space since that's not what we are trained in. Um, and most schools have this really great resource available. Any questions there? All right. Okay. So another key practice is in an end of mediation session that is forward looking. And so from a healing perspective, you know, the end of mediation session is, you know, an important opportunity to discuss the party's outlook for the future. You know, it's an it's again, it's that opportunity to kind of shift away from the events of the past and really kind of committing them to, you know, looking towards the future. And you know, the mediator can use framing techniques to do that. Um, and to um, another opportunity to bring empathy uh, to the parties to help really, you know, with that healing process and to um, help them view kind of their post-mediation world in a positive light. And, and again, as we were talking about earlier with some of the self-help resources, um, the end of mediation session is such a key opportunity to offer up uh, those kinds of materials, and frankly, even other referrals. You know, Cameron talked about uh, referrals to other support groups and, and things like that. You know, that end of mediation session, kind of keeping it forward looking and really kind of holistically helping the person move on and the parties move on, you know, that's again another great opportunity to talk about and, and figure out what are some referrals that need to be made at that time. So you can kind of think of it as an enhanced close out, you know, again, so really empathy, reframing to the future and the self-help resources. So any questions on that? I have one, <laughs> which is, so I think this goes so well when we're signing an agreement, right? Like it's easy, it's easy yeah. to say, we're gonna sign it, we're gonna move on, life is good. Yeah. Um, how, what are some of your tips and tricks for when we're not reaching resolution 
four, we are reaching resolution on kind of one major issue, but we're agreeing to continue work going forward on the rest. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. Um, there's even more healing to do there, isn't there, Kamran, where you don't yeah, have the absolutely. settlement itself to provide the, the, the true bandage, so to say, of, of the, the dispute and kind of bringing that together. And so all the more reason for this end of mediation session to really focus on these other elements because there are going to be kind of maybe more open rooms, so to say, um, and what are the things to talk about. So, yeah, I think, you know, reframing into a positive I still think it's critical. It's so while maybe this particular dispute hasn't been resolved, there is a, you know, it doesn't mean that there isn't a path forward, but it doesn't mean that um, you only orient to the past. So I think it is a, a heavier lift, but I, I just think it validates and underscores even more uh, the importance of the end of mediation session. Are there other ways to kind of help the parties move on at least emotionally and some of that forgiveness even if the dispute itself is not fully resolved. That's a good point and I'll say uh, you know by way of background it occurred to me as you were sharing um, mm -hmm. that folks might not know that we do this kind of in some instances as a joint session but also um, as individual sessions yes. so there can be you know particularly in that context that you were just describing Yes. Um, there can be kind of a one-on-one -on -one with an individual party saying, all right, so here we are. We exactly. Work, and that's what I had. Out. Yes, yeah. I should have said. Exactly. I think that's exactly where you can get pretty, you know, deep into, you know, with this individual in a co very confidential, just one-on-one -on -one setting to really kind of talk about and reframe so that they are kind of forward-looking and not mired in the past. Yeah. Uh, Last one, number six. All right, um, post mediation assistance. So this actually is one of two ways that CAB reaches out after mediation ends. So we do formally close mediation and the parties know and we talk it through. Um, and there's kind of two things we do once mediation ends. So there's a satisfaction survey, which is about process. It's about the board, another board member, so another member of CAB USA who knows nothing about the, the dispute or really the parties. They really just have a phone number and a name um, and that's it. That person calls and says, hey, I don't know anything about you. No one's gonna tell me anything about your dispute. It's totally confidential, but I'm calling to just say, how was your process and experience with us? Right? Did you find that neutrality was actually practiced? Um, did you find that we were confidential? Those sorts of things. Um, and we use those metrics to then self-assess, right? To know kind of where we need to develop further practice and where we're doing well and just need to maintain that practice. Um, and it's been a really great tool. So that's satisfaction survey. That's not this thing on the slide which is post-mediation sure. assistance. This call is three to six months later, and it's the mediator of that particular case or co-mediator of that particular case, calling the parties individually and saying, where are you now? Six months out, what does life look like? Are you, able, are you guys living with the resolution that you came to? Or are you abiding by the agreement that you worked out together? Um, if you're not, there is no agreement, then have you sought some other form of help? Did you file a lawsuit? Like what happened? Um, and really the hope there is to have one more touch point to make a referral where it's needed. And to also, you know, again, put them on that path of healing to really utilize our empathy tools again. And to again, sort of say, life can be better. We can get better from here um, and give them an opportunity to be heard and to seek even self-help resources to pass those articles on that Zora was just talking through a moment ago. 